Um, it's an honor to be here. Uh, I thank Gina for having me here. And it's, of course, it's an honor always to be on the same stage with um, a true legend, a true uh, hero, Harry Belafonte. Um, well, first, let me just say that, that what I just watched, uh, what we all just sort of participated in was very powerful and very moving. To hear the voice of this person, um, Herman Wallace, to be in the mind of, uh, of him and what he'd been through, I think is important and it's essential for us to understand not just the issue of solitary confinement, but what has happened to political prisoners in this country. And what it speaks to me is, um, in terms of the growth of solitary confinement, in terms of the growth of incarceration in this country, is the fact that the United States has the United States government has an obsession with criminalizing, incarcerating um, our people, young people, working class people, poor people, black people, and for those that have resisted historically have also been criminalized. And the issue of solitary confinement in particular, the fact that so many people across the country are locked in, caged in these very small spaces for so much time of their life, some have, as we know weeks, some as we know days, but many we now know across the country have is years, decades. It's grown because of the unchecked power of the U.S. government to not just incarcerate criminalize here, but to do, to destroy and commit destruction abroad. And it's also the need in which there needs to be the emergence and the growth of a movement in this country that not only challenges solitary confinement, but challenges the U.S. government's obsession with criminalization and locking people in cages. This is a really kind of odd situation. This is just a website that's going to be, that is now free, available around the world. Anyone can access it at any time. Um, but seeing it in a theater, I mean, I've never, it's, it's, it's been really amazing to see, see how people would react if we had never created it like that. Um, and so it, to go to your question though, the inspiration was really, we had all this amazing audio content that I had recorded for the f purpose of the film, but at a certain point when I was talking to Herman, you know, whenever he could make a call, I was recording it just, it, it became, you know, just part of my life that I wanted to make sure that we had this archive. And in fact, at some point I thought, oh, like, when the film is done, I should put it up some, I should make it available somehow. This, you know, I have probably 40, 50 hours of, of content, but um, I don't know if anyone would have ever wanted to sift through that. And it was actually through the film board um, approaching me that said, look, this actually could work as, a, as an interactive story. And um, I was, you know, a little bit um, uncertain of what that meant, but I was really excited both by the possibility of making sure, giving Herman's voice literally a new outlet. And because I had heard all of these things for all these years and just wanted to make sure as many other people could hear it. And um, so I think about 90% or more is audio that is not in the film. It's audio that was just recorded um, that we didn't have room for in the film that I thought was really important. And I also thought that this is a technology that is, you know, it's, it's the future, right? People, it's for young people. How are they gonna access this story? You know, they may not wanna sit down and watch an 80 minute documentary, um, but they may be open to like playing with it for two minutes, for five minutes, for 10 minutes. And we really wanted to construct it that way that you could, you know, the entire experience you'll get cut off after 20 minutes, but you can get something out of it even if you just, you know, spend a couple minutes on it and hopefully you know, it intrigues you enough to, to want you to, to know more. Mr. Belafonte. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask you please to speak to the history of repression against people who challenge oppression in this country? Okay. Uh, First of all, just let me express my delight at sharing the platform with everyone that's up here. And uh, to the people who are in the audience who have taken the time out to sit and listen to this exchange. I've been at this game, actively at this game now for <laughs> 70 years. 
I'm soon to be 89 years of age. And uh, I have been involved in almost every major campaign in America. And in my the later half of my life in most of the world, in Africa and South Africa and liberation movements around the world. And I've seen the global commonality and the struggle against oppression uh, and uh, the issues of the class system. I keep working at and supporting these things because each time we set a campaign for ourselves and think we have gained the high ground, we only find that some days later or some years later, we seem to be eternally coming back to square one. I don't know how many startups I've been at that uh, have tried to deal with the issue of incarceration and prisons. I visited most, not most, but I visited many prisons between Sing Sing and, and New York and Tracy out in California and every place in between and spend quality time with those who are incarcerated. And I find that the overwhelming majority are there with extreme uh, consequences of injustice. They're there for things that no one should ever have been arrested for or punished for. They were there because in most instances they were making social protest against inhumane conditions. The fact that the state consistently uses imprisonment as a tool to uh, undermine and to frustrate those people who would like to change the paradigm uh, has resulted in America having the largest prison population in the world, as you all know, and has devoted an awful lot of its resources to continuing to build more prisons. Recently down in Baltimore during the, the rebellion against uh, oppression, uh, the federal government stepped in, I'm sorry, the state stepped in and uh, flooded the streets with the National Guard. It was fixed bayonets and threats they said, uh, uh, among other things, we set a curfew. And the curfew is to ensure that at 10 o'clock at night, everyone is off the streets. And uh, if not, uh, they shall pay the severe consequence of uh, the wrath of the state. In a meeting with a group of the young leaders discussing this, thing about the curfew, uh, I pointed out that uh, we had just been offered a golden opportunity. And the golden opportunity was to, in fact, violate the curfew, to get arrested, and to fill up what prison space existed with the bodies of citizens and make the prison system ungovernable to make it uh, unable to function. And if they went into extreme behavior with solitary confinement and all the things that they would do to revert to the techniques of uh, nonviolence uh, designed by Gandhi and practiced fully by Dr. King because if they put you in solitary confinement, then make the choice to strain the system to the degree that uh, it may be your death, but there's a moral consequence to that kind of conduct that the universe would not tolerate. And we have yet to uh, come back from the summer hiatus because soon uh, much of America will be back to business as usual. Uh, there'll be more Ferguson's, there'll be more deaths, there'll be more police violence. And the question is, what do organizers around the country do in the face of this uh, rather difficult pl plot by the state?
Let me step away from that for one second and then make this observation. When you say the state or the government or uh, one assumes that somehow it is un inhuman or unhuman, the men and women who sit that make the decisions to do all this cruelty of fellow human beings, uh, how can they be reached? I watched the Pope in his visit here doing some remarkable things and saying some remarkable things for a man of his stature coming from an institution that has been so replete uh, with, uh, uh, with behavior and things that have frustrated liberation movements. The fact that Francis has stepped in here and speaks differently, says I'm glad I lived long enough to see that turnaround. I'm not quite sure the impact it will have on the institution because he's just a human being. But he is a human being with conscience and uh, out of the tradition of the church, he has stepped into a space where he has decided to become an activist. Uh, I'm here today because each time young people engage upon practices that are designed to combat the oppression we are talking about, the brutality we talk about, uh, the inhumanity that prevails, I draw upon the wisdom of the years and all the wise men and women that I've talked that have shaped the way in which we did business in the past, but I take nothing for granted. With technology, with all the different things at our disposal, what ideas uh, we're able to come up with that's a new approach to the issues of incarceration and the overall issue of oppression. I'm not quite sure I understand what this is all about. I'm not quite sure I understand how it builds and what will be done with this interchange that we've watched take place. Uh, I've been in touch with Herman Wallace and uh, others who are living a wretched, ex a wretched, a wretched existence in, in, uh, in prison. And I just know that I have got to respond to new ideas, to new techniques, and in that context, I can uh, leave here uh, having said uh, I played the game to the end and I did what was asked of me and I made myself available. And I hope that what we're doing with this technology and with why we are all here today at the invitation of the film festival will set us on a path for some new commitment that will change or enhance the struggle that we've all been in trying to change the way this country does business. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, but I have to say, in, in directly answering your question, what change would I like to see in the justice system, not the prison system, but the justice system that it serves? is a, um, a change in the, in the conceptualization of that system. Um, one that uh, treats uh, confinement as a scarce resource, not as a, as a one-size-fits-all remedy to every uh, offense. Um, secondly, that uh, replaces 90% of the buildings that they have today with, with uh, buildings that are um, intended to address people's human nature and their human potential. So the, the time that the jury or the judge uh, decides that a person needs to be in confinement can be time that addresses their needs and time that will, that will allow them a successful return to, to society in a way that they're uh, better positioned to um, live happy, productive lives. And um, uh, we call this sustainable justice, um, treating uh, basically use sustainability th thinking towards the justice system design. 
So there's a, a lot, it has a lot of currency. Uh, we're about to have a, a visioning workshop about this notion in, in Miami in November uh, with the people that are looking at replacing the buildings that, that Miami has, current Dade County has. Um, so there are a number of very progressive strengths, believe it or not. And um, I, it's kind of fun getting to play the, the prison architect, you know, bad guy in this panel in a way because usually I'm the guy that people are mad at because I'm being too leading edge and too much on, in the progressive strain. But anyway, I, I'm not a prison architect, sorry. I've, I've, I've designed a lot of jails. I've I do mostly do courthouses. But I guess the thing that I would suggest that I, I, I focus on is the practical everyday experience of someone who comes into contact with the justice system. Um, I don't know whether it's a political crime or an everyday, you know, jump to turn style or knock somebody in the head and took their stuff or, or just got in a fight, fight with their uh, beloved, their loved one in New York City over the last 20 years, um, it's been a very bad thing to be arrested uh, because it would often take up to 72 hours just to get before a judge so that you, a determination could be made as to whether you should stay or not. But, and if you could see some of the places that people have been staying for 72 hours, that's in fact been found by judges to be cruel and unusual punishments. So we've done renovations in all five boroughs to provide um, speedy arrest to arraignment times, 24 hours um, rather than 72 hours to get before the judge and then, and then move on. Um, the um, notion of a humane correctional facility, prison, sounds completely far-fetched, um, I would say, to people that have never been in one, um, either to visit a loved one. That's kind of my um, point of entry to this, was visiting my, my father-in-law at, at uh, Lorton Penitentiary down in Washington. Uh, back in the uh, early 70s where he was serving a five-year term. My second point of entry to the prison system was as a young architect uh, responding to a, a court order to install a second shower in the Deer Island uh, jail up in Boston where 175 guys were sharing one shower and we you know, put in a second shower and some other uh, emergency improvements. Uh, thankfully that facility is now gone um, and replaced by modern facilities. It's um, hard to, and I don't want to go on too long because I know there's a lot of other things for us to talk about, but it, um, New York City right now is at a historic moment. Um, the incarcerated population in New York City, the jail population in New York City is down from over 20,000 to about 10,000. There's good reason to believe that in de Blasio administration that could drop again. Um, my, my question to New York City is when you're down around 5,000 people, why do you need Rikers Island anymore? Um, why not close Rikers Island? Um, I once heard um, a director of corrections, the commissioner of corrections for the state of Colorado actually, describe solitary confinement as the solution that we employ for a problem for which we have no solution. So even at that level, they recognize that solitary confinement is ineffective, it's certainly very costly, and certainly very damaging to the people that, that experience it. We say that we are a nation of laws, and we are governed by that fact. And are the, the laws are created by man, or human beings, I should say. And uh, often those that, that approach to law is bent into the favor of those who have the power. Uh, it seems to me that one of the things uh, Dr. King constantly talked about, Democrates, and the fact that the greatest nonviolent weapon that has been given to us to use is, in fact, uh, the vote. And that, that vote can carry enough uh, uh, power to change the way in which uh, the horizon is shaped. I used to look at that as, an, as, a, as, a, as a task that's uh, not uh, doable or easily doable, only to come to find that uh, the prophetic remarks that he made were, in fact, the bottom line. If we do not change the way in which the legislators and the politicians uh, control the law, then we will forever find that no matter what we come up with to end uh, uh, solitary confinement and uh, inhumane punishment 
and, and pass some little uh, resistance to that fact, we will find ourselves with these guys creating new laws, new obstacles, new methodology. And the thing that we need to do is to get a serious study of the Constitution, co-op those who have taken it from us, and use the power of the Constitution and what it says to put people in office who will protect the law and protect citizens from using the law to crucify citizens. And the campaign that we're on now is one of the major thrusts uh, with Sankofa, uh, which is part of the sponsorship of today, is to get artists who are of high profile and who, are, who command a constituency to say, can we find a common way in which to popular artists to shed a light on this community problem and by shedding a light on the community problem stimulate for our citizens the fact that there is a debate that can be had and an engagement that can be had that will help us make the change. And the whole issue is the vote. And the whole issue is who we send to office to manage the systems that oppress us. Thank you very much. <laughs>